this is Edgar Allan Poe, uh, a couple of weeks after he attempted suicide. And you can see here, uh, reading the years down the other way, that again, I mean, not that anybody would say that Edgar Allan Poe was probably a wildly, enthusiastically happy man at any point in his life, but he, he became less so over time. And like many people, before modern medications existed, if you look at, at the course of people's illnesses prior to the 1950s when medications began to be available to treat this illness, people had this, again, this progressive course. As time went by, he had more and more episodes, a suicide attempt in the year before he died, and then um, a really almost chronic course in the last year of his life. Um, as I said earlier, bipolar illness is a very genetic illness. It's, one of the, it's the most genetic illness in psychiatry, and it's one of the more genetic illnesses in medicine. So one of the, again, if you're putting together this kind of picture of what, a, what is the evidence for a given individual having bipolar illness, if there's a family history of it, uh, it's a little bit more convincing. So this is uh, Alfred Lord Tennyson. And what I'd like to do is show you two slides here showing his uh, family history. This goes back, um, th this line will go down to Tennyson's father, to be Tennyson's father. But you can see going way back in his pedigree on both sides of the family, a great deal of very severe depression, insanity, violence, murder, suicide. Um, and all of his aunts and uncles were affected by uh, significant mood disorders. But what's particularly interesting, and, and Tennyson's father died insane, but what's particularly interesting is this huge sibship here, of a very large family. The three eldest son, uh, Tennyson sons uh, all walked off with top literary awards when they were at Cambridge, and they all had very severe mood disorders. And when I say severe mood disorders, I mean Tennyson was treated for depression um, at different points throughout his life. One of his brothers was in an insane asylum for 60 years. Another was in an insane asylum for a year. Uh, all the rest of them were treated in one form or another for depression. One of them died of acute mania. This is Lord Byron. Uh, this is, Byron had the great advantage of having a sense of humor. His wife seems to have had essentially none. Um, she said, the day after my marriage, he said, you were determined not to marry a man in whose family there was insanity. You have done very well indeed. Or some ironical expression of that effect, followed by the information that his maternal grandfather had committed suicide and a cousin had been mad and set fire to a house. Um, Byron was being uncharacteristically understated here. In fact, you can trace back uh, the genes kind of coming in at the uh, several generations back on Byron's side of the family, um, in the Bar Lord Barclay's side, and he married into Byron family. His grandfather had a breakdown, a major breakdown. His father, Mad Jack Byron, um, committed suicide, and he had suicide and violence and insanity on his mother's side. Byron's daughter, who was quite well-known mathematician, Ada Byron, um, had uh, delusions when she was manic and when she was depressed, and hallucinations both. Byron, as I said, did have a great sense of humor, and his letters are uh, certainly the most entertaining letters I've ever read in the English language. He said, I should many a good day have blown my brains out, but for the recollection that it would have given pleasure to my mother-in-law. <laughs> and even then, if I could have been certain to haunt her. Um, Ernest Hemingway, of course, family, unfortunately, um, plagued by suicide. And just to give you a sense of that, um, the amount of, of suicide in the family, uh, it's, it's quite, it's unfortunately not that uncharacteristic because suicide also seems to have a genetic component to it in addition to the illnesses that it runs with. Virginia Woolf, um, again, just, I'm not gonna go into details because of time, but just to say that her family tree is saturated with significant mood disorders cousin who died of acute mania. And again, it's important to note that it's not just suicide that kills people. Heart disease, very much elevated rate of severe heart disease in people who have bipolar, untreated bipolar illness. And people died of manic exhaustion, not, not infrequently before modern medications. 
um, and she herself, of course, died by suicide. And this is Van Gogh's family tree. And you can see it wasn't just Vincent who was disturbed. His brother died psychotic, Teo, a great supporter of his work. Um, and the two of them wrote back and forth about their shared heredity of melancholia. The daughter, uh, their sister, Wilhelmina, was in an insane asylum for decades. And their youngest brother committed suicide. So let me just get to a little bit very, very briefly on what do we know from modern studies um, and, and collections of studies about mood disorders in writers and artists. This is just a partial listing of the studies, and I'm going to go into the details. But if you look over here on the left, you can see the population rate. That's what the rate of depression in the general population is, the rate of bipolar illness in the general population. And you can see this huge elevation in the studies that have been done of increased rates of bipolar illness and depression. And these are in various groups of writers and artists, poets. Um, you can also see the same thing in terms of suicide rates. Um, the expected rate in the population is about 1% of people will die by suicide. And you can see these very elevated rates in populations of artists and writers. So what might be the relationship? I mean, why should such a an awful, devastating disease have any relationship whatsoever to something as remarkable as human imagination. And there are a lot of reasons why the, this relationship might obtain. Some of it are acute changes when people get manic. Um, they think a lot faster. Their associations loosen up. They become very unusual. I'll get to that in a minute. Um, they perceive things in different ways. They have different kinds of levels of energy and also long-term characteristics of the illness that bipolar illness is associated with particular kinds of temperaments, um, often risk-taking temperaments, uh, fiery temperaments, um, problems with authority, all those kinds of things that are good under some circumstances and not so helpful under others. What artists and writers, if you interview artists and writers, what they focus upon is the experience of the intense changes in mood, the experience of profound melancholy and the ecstatic states and having that range of experiences to draw upon. Uh, this is up here really metaphorically. It's a very, very old, one of the original um, studies. This is a, a brain study, brain imaging studies, done of a woman who had rapid cycling bipolar illness. She was manic 24 hours and depressed 24 hours, uh, hypomanic, mildly manic, and then up, down, up, down for 24 hours. And I only put this up here to sh just say, again, literally metaphorically, that it is um, different things are going on in the brain when people are manic and when they're depressed. And um, not surprisingly, but I think it's particularly important some of the changes that go on when people are manic. Um, again, I'm not going to go into details, but there have been a lot of speculations about why, if you give people, if you give undergraduates, kind of the white rats of the psychology world, if you give undergraduates a task and you want to test uh, a very common measure of creativity is word association, word productivity. So if I say to you the word tulip, I could uh, rate you on the number of associations, the total number of associations that you come up with the word tulip and the total number of original responses because there are norms, national norms for that. And what you find with people who are mildly manic, um, they come up with three times the number of associations and three times the number of original associations. The brain is a very fermenting sort of thing when people are mildly manic. Um, this is, interestingly, if you take these same undergraduates and you artificially elevate their mood, normal undergraduates, and you artificially elevate their mood through music, what you find is an increase in the same productivity. The elated states seem to be particularly capable of changing uh, the chemistry of the brain or the other way around. 